I was asked to talk about um, new treatment options, um, but I will hopefully provide a, a fairly broad overview um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have time for questions at the end as well. So uh, to highlight the treatment gap, which I think is astounding in epilepsy, um, as many of you know, um, there are uh, almost 3 million people in the United States living with epilepsy. And of those patients, about two, one third of them have failed um, two or more anti-epileptic drugs, putting them into the drug-resistant um, epilepsy category. So that's almost 900,000 people in the United States. So here's where we see the first treatment gap. So those patients um, should be evaluated for further treatments in, the, in an epilepsy monitoring unit. So look at that number. 60,000 people are monitored, monitored per year and there are almost a million patients with epilepsy not responding to medications in our country. And then if you go even further down, um, there are only about 3,000 epilepsy surgeries per year, about 4,000 VNS implants per year, and then um, other um, uh, therapies which we'll talk about today, only about 3,000 per year. So um, there's that huge gap. So there's even of those patients that end up getting referred to an epilepsy monitoring unit, there are still 50,000 per year that are evaluated but don't receive any more aggressive treatments. Um, meaning, and then ultimately only one to two percent of our drug resistant epilepsy population is receiving uh, more advanced treatments every year. So clearly a big treatment gap that's so important what the Epilepsy Foundation is do in, doing in spreading awareness and I also take the opportunity to spread awareness whenever I can. So how do we treat seizures? I think this is a really important things, thing to, um, to think about and keep in mind. And what it comes down to is something very simple. So we think that when someone has a seizure, either there's too much excitation um, or there's not enough inhibition. So the scale is, is or the seesaw is going too, uh, too far in one or the other direction. And so when we think about treating epilepsy, we think about either decreasing the amount of excitation or increasing the amount of inhibition so that we can even that scale or even the seesaw and the seizures don't occur. So that can be done from all of these different, um, th different um, methods. So we can either use our drugs um, to affect um, excitation and inhibition, or we can use surgery to, uh, to disrupt the, the network that's causing the seizures, or we can use neuromodulation, which is um, something that um, we've, we've been using for quite a while with a vagal nerve stimulator, um, but we also have new treatment options like the NeuroPACE responsive nerve, neurostimulator system, which I'll discuss later. So this is another way of looking at the different treatments, and I will give a broad overview of most of these treatments in my talk. So of course, all the way to the right, we can use anti-epileptic drugs, and we can continue have, doing more and more trials with anti-epileptic drugs. Um, diet is something that's more often used in the pediatric population, and I won't really touch on today. And then um, different brain surgery techniques, which this list has been growing, and I will um, go through um, in some detail in my talk. Um, resective surgery we've been doing for quite a long time, um, but we now have less invasive methods, which I'll show you, like um, the MR laser ablation. Some people call that visual aids. And then the NeuroPACE Responsive Neurostimulator System, or RNS. And then finally, all the way to the left is the vagal nerve stimulator, um, which I don't put in the brain surgery category because it's not brain surgery, um, it's, um, and, and it's much less invasive. So this is the, the, the shortest part of, of my overview, and that's the new drug options. This could be a talk in its own, um, but to highlight some of the newer drug options that have come out, many of them um, are extended release formulations of previously known drugs. Um, and that, and to, to, you know, it's important that, that patients discuss whether these are good options for them. Most of them do come in brand only, so for certain patients it could be quite a bit more expensive. There are advantages to extended release formulations. For instance, it can keep your levels more even throughout the day. It may allow you to take medications only once a day in some circumstances. Um, and then the other most new, new medication on the block is also prampanil or Ficampa. Actually, there was recent research published that it indicates that it can actually be used for both generalized and focal epilepsy, so it's a broad spectrum agent. And this is working on that excitatory part of the, um, the epilepsy network. It, it, is a, it works on a receptor 
for glutamate, which is the most, the most common excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. Not on this list, but should be mentioned, I think people still think of some medications like Vimpat or Lecosamide um, as newer. Um, it's now been on the market for quite some time. And then, not new at all, but newer to the United States um, is Onfi or Clobazam. Um, this has been used in, in Canada and Europe for over 20 years, but um, only in, in the United States, only for the last three or four years. But um, those are medications that are being used more and more in our patients. So I'm, getting, I'm going to introduce this as another medication because I think that, um, that this is the number one thing, first of all, that's asked in my epilepsy clinic. And um, as a scientist, I think of marijuana or um, CBD, as some people talk about it, as another possible drug option. That's, it's, it, and, I, and I hope that you'll take, take that home when I go through my slides because it's a very complicated drug. Um, and we need to learn more about it, but it is a drug. Um, just like um, lecosamide or clobazam, like I just mentioned. So it's really important to keep in mind. This has gotten a lot of press, um, and I think that's in one way wonderful because it brings um, epilepsy to the national conscious and people are being, becoming more aware of epilepsy because this has gotten so much press. But there is danger in that um, and I think it's given some patients false hope that this, this quote unquote natural option is the cure-all. So I'm gonna go through the data and I'm gonna spend some time on this because um, I hope that it gives you some insight to why it's not getting approved so quickly and why your physicians may be resistant to recommending it um, you know, with a lot of confidence, because we just don't know yet. I do want to give recognition to some of my colleagues at the University of Colorado, where they do have legalized marijuana. They have um, done some work on this and shared some of their slides with me. Um, and again, they ha I've spoken with them, and they have a different type of insight into the use of medical marijuana and epilepsy, because in their state, they can prescribe it. So I'm not going to go through this whole slide because it's quite complicated, but I, it's mostly to highlight that this is a very complex drug. So cannabis um, actually is com com uh, made up of 500 different compounds. And depending upon where it's grown and what kind of, of marijuana that you have, it could vary significantly because it is such a complex um, compound. In the cannabinoid group, there are 66 known phytocannabinoids in 10 subclasses. The THC portion is that main psychoactive component, that part that makes you high. The CBD, or cannabidiol portion, is the part that actually has been shown in some animal studies and, it, and to, to maybe improve the um, incidence of seizures and also um, is now being used in some clinical trials. There are other um, types of cannabinoids. There's the endocannabinoids. This is the kind of cannabinoids that we all have in our brains already. They're um, endogenous. That means they're in the human brain already. And then there's synthetic cannabinoids, which you may have heard about. They are, you know, can be purchased on the um, illicit market, and um, there have been reports of very serious um, health problems associated with that, especially in young people. Finally, hemp, which is part of the, um, the plant, um, and this is actually made to, used to make some industrial materials and, um, and like clothing goods and such. So, so this is the endocannabinoid. These are the ones that we all have in our system. And I'm not going to go through the chemical structure, but I think it highlights why this drug might actually be useful. We already have something in, the, in our body that's very similar to it. And so enhancing the action of, of that substance um, may help um, or hurt some parts of our brain. Again, this is just more detail about that um, endogenous endocannabinoids that we all have. Um, fairly complex, but I think I'm put, I, I show this to highlight how, how complex it is. So you can see in the bottom right that activation or use of this substance can lead to changes across so many different parts of our, ner our nervous system and our neurons, our cells that are, make up our brain. So what is the clinical evidence for epilepsy? So 
um, there isn't very much, which is something that I think is really important to highlight. And it's, we need more evidence. I'm not saying that we don't need more evidence, um, but I think it's important to know what evidence there is. So there actually have only been a total of four trials with nine to 15 participants in each trial. So that's very small numbers. Con in contrast to our, our, our uh, standard drug trials, which will have thousands of patients enrolled. In these four trials, there was improvement in seizure frequency in half of the trials. Not half of the patients, half of the trials. Um, so interestingly, um, in a survey of parents of children with treatment-resistant epilepsy, they, um, pr they presented a survey electronically on Facebook where there was 150 members. There were 19 responders, and of those, 84% um, reported benefit. So this is a very biased study. I just want to highlight that. And I think it's important to highlight that because when you go on blogs and et cetera and talk about treatments and medical marijuana or anything in epilepsy, you may be getting, a, I, I, would, I, would, I would say you're probably getting a huge misrepresentation of the real clinical experience um, because the people that are reporting on those blogs, they're desperate. Everyone's desperate. We want things to work. And that's something called the placebo effect. And it's something that when you do studies like this, you're not going to get the full story. So um, the co recent Cochrane Review, which is a very well-respected um, type of review that occurs across multiple fields of medicine, concluded that there is no reliable conclusions drawn at present regarding the efficacy of CBD or marijuana as a treatment of epilepsy. And the American Academy of Neurology recent systemic review agreed. There are also um, position statements of multiple different other medical um, associations that all recommended additional research, which I think is crucial, prior to routine clinical use. So what research is going on? So there is a study called the EPA dialect study. Um, which is look, using that CBD portion, which is that portion that I mentioned before, which does not make people high, okay? So um, this is an open label prospective study. Um, they have enrolled 137 participants at 11 sites. And these are in pediatrics with average age of 11. And in this study, um, there was a 51% greater than 50% reduction in seizures. Um, so there was about 50% about of people had some reduction. Um, in subgroups, there was a, a pretty dramatic improvement. And this is what you know, was publicized in, on TV initially with the few patients with this very specific, very rare syndrome called Dravet syndrome, um, where there seems to be some significant um, positive response in this very um, unique sy syndrome. And I think everyone in this audience knows that not all epilepsy is created equal, and there are very complex, different types of epilepsies, and maybe this type of treatment will be very good for some types, but not for others. There were side effects, so I think this is back to my point that this is a drug. Um, there was somnolence or you know, tiredness um, in a good portion, 21%, diarrhea, fatigue, and decreased appetite, all in over 15% of the patients. In this study, there were no changes in like the kidney or uh, blood markers on their labs. Um, there were significant adverse events in 52 patients and in fact, two deaths. Um, 22 were possibly related to the drug and you can see them here. And in fact, 10, per, uh, 10 patients withdrew from the study because of adverse effects. So, um, so that's not that dissimilar from a lot of drug trials or actually it's overall worse. So something to keep in mind, it's, it's maybe natural in that it's a plant, but um, it's certainly not um, without side effects, and um, it is still a drug. So um, this is the, the, the overall um, proposed and ongoing uh, research. Um, there is the ongoing epidialic study um, now in phase two and three for Dravet syndrome and Lennox gusto syndrome. Um, this is the study that I had mentioned earlier, and they're taking it further on to phase two, phase three. Of note, there are interactions with one of the most commonly used drugs in this population, Onfi or Clobazam. 
So this, so marijuana or CBD also does have drug-drug interactions that are really important that we're aware of. Um, and then there are some, um, there are phase one studies in healthy adults um, ongoing with the same compound. And then another study using synthetic um, CBD um, in epilepsy as well. So I'll just highlight um, the, neuro the, 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 the various uh, central nerve, nervous system toxicities with um, uh, mer medical marijuana. Um, the overview is that there's data both from human and animal that there's neuroimaging changes. Um, there's human and animal data for learning memory and cognitive changes. There's data that for worsening uh, risk of major psychiatric disorders and effects on sleep and risk of stroke. So I won't go through this. I highlighted the things that I thought were most important. So um, there were brain changes seen in monkeys, um, especially in the hippocampus, which is our most important memory center, and um, that circuit there. So that is really um, significant. In humans, um, there were changes on imaging in various regions in studies looking at patients smoking marijuana. In addition, another imaging study showed changes in a functional uh, measure, which is functional MRI, um, also in chronic marijuana users, users compared to controls. And um, there are various others. There's actually a, a fairly large body of literature, as you can see, that um, suggests that not only there's changes in our brain networks when we use uh, marijuana, but also it results in um, Effect, affecting possibly the memory areas of your brain and also overall brain volume. So these are all things that I, as a neurologist, am very concerned about. There's also a lot of evidence um, that it affects learning and memory. So um, there, there has been work looking at the effects on a long-term potentiation, which is very important for memory, um, in addition to the hippocampal function. Um, Adolescent rats, um, so in animal studies, have displayed greater cognitive impairment than adults when they've had um, THC um, or uh, marijuana exposure during um, their, their adolescent years. So that's very relevant to our patients our, and um, these studies that we're, we're putting, giving these medications to children. And um, looking at a study of multiple sclerosis patients um, using medical marijuana, um, they, had sh they showed um, poor performance in patients who were using marijuana on various different measures of cognition and um, ability to function. So um, I mentioned there are also psychiatric toxicities. There's been an association with increased risk of schizophrenia in marijuana users and also depression. Um, in addition, um, there have been, there's been a body of work looking at um, difficulty with sleep initiation um, in uh, marijuana users. And finally, this is something I've seen in my own hospital with the syn synthetic CBD analogs. I've, we've unfortunately seen young people come in with strokes. Um, so, um, so these are all very concerning and, again, just highlighting the fact that this is a drug um, and we need to study it. No, I'm, not disc I'm not saying this isn't going to work for some people. We just need to study it and, you know, do, uh, fortunately there is ongoing research. Um, and so th this is another thing that bring comes up all the time and that is that, um, it, you know, there's a variation state to state in terms of um, whether or not you can buy or sell marijuana, whether you can actually grow marijuana. It's very interesting that some states will allow you to sell it but not grow it, et cetera. So it becomes extremely complex and, then, and it's going to be very hard going forward if we can pr prove that it's very efficacious in certain epilepsy syndromes to make sure that we're standardizing the product. It needs to really make, we need to make sure that we're giving the same drug, the same amount of drug every time, just like we do in, with the rest of the pharmaceutical industry. And this just highlights what I just, um, just said. So um, to follow up what they do at Co Children's Hospital of Colorado, where they, um, uh, uh, the, the um, chair of neurology was, a, was previously at Children's Hospital of Pennsylvania, who I know really well, and um, they are, there are people there that are following these patients um, and trying to get, gain more data because their patients are using it, whether or not it's prescribed or not. 
Um, so currently they uh, are, know of 113 patients in their practice that are using medical marijuana or CBD. Um, and they've done retrospective studies to look at the types of patients. And you can see that lennox gastaut syndrome was the most common. They didn't see a response difference by seizure type. And they did EEGs um, in about in 30 patients before and after the um, starting the, uh, the drug. And there was no um, improvement on the EEG in any of the patients. Um, three of the non-responders actually had improvement on their background EEG, which doesn't make much sense. Um, and then for depending upon what drug the patient was taking, um, the response rate seemed to be similar. So um, you can see if it was CBD only, uh, uh, purely, um, that was in 35% of the patients, and um, then other different variations of the compound were in, other, in the remaining patients. Very interestingly, and this is, I think, getting back to the placebo effect and all of our desire to get better, um, is that families that moved out of state, which was 45% of the patients, in order to get medical marijuana therapy, were three times more likely to report an improvement. So, um, so I think, again, this highlights that we need to, to know more about what we're doing here. And, um, and uh, be able to guide families as to what the best thing is to do for their ch child. Um, so what were the other side effects? 56% um, of, of, of the families reported other improvements, improvement in alertness, behavior, language, motor skills, sleep. But 44% had adverse events um, with increase or new seizure types in 16%. Somnolence fatigue were common, GI symptoms, developmental regression, et cetera. Um, so what do they do there? And I think this is important for me to take home because I struggle with how to counsel people on the use of um, medical marijuana. So they actually do not recommend use of CBD for treatment of epilepsy outside of a clinical trial because that's how we will learn whether it works. Um, they give the best current data, including their own experience, and share that there is not good evidence regarding purity, content, or consistency of the uh, CBD products available. And also there are concerns about safety, dosing, drug interactions, and, there's not, and we don't know enough about effectiveness. For the pa families or patients who choose to use it, we, they work with them to assess safety and get the most objective data that they can. So how do they do that? Um, safety, they do get baseline labs and then get labs every four weeks to assess whether there's changes in their Blood, level, blood counts, their liver function, et cetera. They also will check their other anti-seizure medication levels to make sure that the, the CBD isn't affecting the, the levels of the other medications, which is really crucial. They encourage patients' families or the patients to keep a seizure diary, and then they are tracking their EEGs to make sure that there's not, there's not any worsening or to track if there's actually improvement. The, the, the goal is actually to keep the other medications unchanged, and um, there, there's a lot of concern about you know, rapidly stopping other drugs and resulting in status epilepticus injury and hospitalization. And, now, and they are, when appropriately, uh, ruling them in, a, in this, their observational research study. So in conclusion, I know I spent a lot of time on this, but in, in reality, I spend a lot of time on this every day in clinic. So um, it was, this was a good process for me to go through to kind of uh, solidify my thoughts. Um, but I think it's important if you can spread the word about the need for more research, um, that would be really um, invaluable. So um, the CBD system is a, has significant representation in many brain regions, so it's, it has very broad action. I think it is a very promising target, but the mechanisms are very complex and we need to know more. Clinical data um, is available for some indications, but for epilepsy it's still very sparse and often poorly conducted. We need more um, research that's conducted um, across multi-center studies in a valid way. The extensive literature on potential toxicities really highlights the need for safety monitoring by a physician, especially in our young folks. And um, unfortunately, the regulatory measures across the country are very inconsistent in evolving, and that really makes this all more complicated. Um, so, and finally, the increased use of these kind of complementary alternative medicine indicates that there's really an unmet therapeutics need 
and highlights this need for patients and their families to talk to their doctor. So I think if you want to take anything home from this, if you do cho choose to, to um, use CBD or marijuana for your epilepsy, you please communicate it to your physician. They need to actually follow um, your labs and your other drug levels and make sure it's safe for you. And then um, it needs to be done in a very controlled way. So that's how we'll really um, answer this question about for whom CBD can help. So um, hopefully that, that was somewhat clear. It's a very complicated topic. And I can, I can um, point you to um, a recently published review article if you want even more information um, by uh, Oren Davinsky and Dan Friedman in the New England Journal of Medicine. That's a review article on um, CBD and the treatment of epilepsy, which is um, really an excellent um, resource to get, get, go into the, to even more detail on the topic. So what are the other treatments? And this is a total shift now. I'm getting away from drugs and moving to that left side of that, 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 that I, on that initial slide that I showed you of different treatments. So um, temporal lobectomy, this is not a new treatment, but I think if I don't mention it, then I'm not doing my job. Um, there was this wonderful study in the New England Journal um, by Sam Weeb showing when you randomize patients that had drug-resistant epilepsy and temporal lobe of arising in the temporal lobe, that in the surgical group at one year, about 60% were seizure-free, whereas in the medical group, 8% were seizure-free. Um, and um, what's interesting here, and which is what's something that really um, drives me in my research, that there is a three, two to three times greater chance of good post-surgical outcome if an MRI or histopatholo histopathological lesion, which means on the tissue that was resected, um, there was an abnormality, is, so if, if we can identify that. And that's something that I'm not going to get into today, but really motivates me to try to find better imaging techniques to identify where patients' seizures are coming from. So this is one of our newer therapies, and um, for, for um, patients that either have medical, co medical problems that, that mean that they can't undergo a big surgical resection, or um, they um, are very scared of the big surgical resection, um, it is certainly a very good approach. And I think now that we're using it more and more, it may become the first line approach, because if you do this, um, initially, it doesn't mean that if it didn't work, we can't go back and do the standard temporal lobectomy, standard, standard temporal lobectomy that I showed on the previous si si slide. So, what is this? Um, it's still brain surgery. Um, the the neurosurgeon um, will put in a burr hole or a little hole and put in a laser beam, basically, and um, under MRI guidance, will uh, kind of burn and liquefy the tissue where the seizure is coming from. And Maybe that can be a little bit more clear when you see pictures. So you can see um, in the upper left where one of those little catheters is being put into the hippocampal region, which is that little red um, circle in the A diagram. And then you can see um, as, as um, they are in the MRI scanner slowly um, uh, ablating with the laser that area. So what's great for patients is that they usually are in the hospital for one day, um, go home the next day, and um, it's, so it's very well tolerated. Um, it's mostly been done in patients with temporal lobe epilepsy, but we are starting to use it for other types of epilepsy. And in fact, this was developed for um, brain tumors that couldn't be surgically um, resected or you couldn't reach or safely resect. So um, this is a, a one case report that's been published, but we have done some laser ablation at Penn, so I think um, there's a more broad use for, for um, heterotopias are not, or seizures that are rising outside of the middle of the temporal lobe. It's very quick. It takes a lot longer than that because they have to, to go in and out of the MRI scanner, et cetera, but, um, but it's a pretty simple um, approach compared to the big uh, resective surgery that we do standardly. So this is another approach that actually um, Dr. Lucas at Penn developed, um, which uh, has allowed us to um, treat some patients that we wouldn't have been able to treat. Um, this is a, a technique where he actually is able to um, access the middle of the temporal lobe, 
through kind of behind the eye, actually. Um, it's very good cosmetic results, and you can actually selectively take out regions there that you couldn't have gotten at before with a standard temporal lobectomy without taking out a huge amount of tissue to get there. So um, it's a really interesting um, procedure um, that we've had, uh, we've had now a lot of patients undergo and had a very excellent cosmetic results and, um, and seizure freedom results. So not new, but it, I'd be remiss not to talk about the vagal nerve stimulator and also um, to highlight there is a new version of the vagal nerve stimulator. So um, that is what is new in VNS. So the vagal nerve stimulator, I think it's important to realize is a broad spectrum device, meaning that it can, it can be used for any type of epilepsy. Whereas some surgical options cannot be used in generalized types of epilepsy or epilepsy coming from many regions in the brain. The mechanism is largely unknown, but it's thought to be a, a fancy word called neuromodulate, which um, means that it's um, trying to uh, affect the overall excitation inhibition balance that we talked about before. So in patients with the VNS, there's about a little bit more than half responder rate with, with at least a 50% reduction in seizures. And that doesn't sound fabulous, right? Um, to most people, but if you compare that to when you're trying your third medication, where the chance of, of becoming seizure-free is less than 1%, then it sounds excellent. Um, so um, I, I think I use vagal nerve stimulators a lot. Um, it's a very non-invasive outpatient procedure. It is not brain surgery. Um, and <clears throat> and some patients do exceedingly well on it. So um, something that you should talk to your physician about if you haven't already and are still having um, seizures. So they've just developed a new device called the Aspire device, which actually um, adds a feature to the device where it actually can be triggered by an increase in heart rate or tachycardia. Um, and actually, when patients have focal types of seizures, about 85% of them will have a significant increase of heart, in heart rate during the seizure. So there is some, some sense to, to trying to trigger to increase heart rate. This is not data specifically on the, art, on the, the Aspire device or that heart rate device, but overall for vagal nerve stimulator. And what I like to highlight here is that um, it does seem that, that, and this is the same for the NeuroPace responsive nerve stimulator device, that over time there's increase, it works better. So increase in efficacy. So you can see that at two years, um, four years, six years, there's actually, um, it does seem to work better. Um, so I, the point of this is that I always tell patients not to give up on these devices at the one year mark. So um, it may still improve your seizures. So this is the Aspire device and, I, and also what really any of the vagal nerve stimulator devices look like, um, where, it, where there's a, the device is actually implanted on the chest, under the, che under the muscle of the chest wall, um, and um, similar to like a pacemaker placement is a, 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 which more people are familiar with. And then the, the vagal nerve, which is in the neck, is what is um, being stimulated. has multiple things. So um, the, this is what I said before, where there's a very high incidence of, or high rate of, most patients have increased heart rate during seizures. So, um, so in this, the new device, the Aspire device, you can actually program it, the doctor can program it for a certain heart rate to start firing off the stimulation. So um, the downside of this is that um, it does take up more, more of the battery life. So depending upon what your physician sets the device at, the battery might actually drain more quickly. So that's something to consider. And if, if the, but the, with a new device, you don't have to use the, the heart rate portion. So if the heart rate portion doesn't seem to be helping at all, then you can turn it off and the battery will last longer for the vagal nerve stimulator. And this is just an, the idea of it in that where you see that with the increased heart rate, which is on the very, very bottom, that then it would, then it would, it would cause the device to give a stimulation. And when they did a very small study in, an epilep in epilepsy monitoring units, they found that over 60% of seizures um, when they were treated uh, during the increased heart rate ended with the stimulation. Now, 
my argument to that would be some of them might have ended anyway, so that's a, that I think is overstating the results, um, but um, that's what we have. And again, it's a very small study. Um, this was approved by the FDA as an equivalent device, not a better device. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, so this is the similar safety data um, to the original VNS device where most common uh, complaint is with voice alteration and then, um, and then other side effects are listed here. <clears throat> so um, um, the next thing to move on to, which is also fairly new, um, but has been talked about in the epilepsy world for decades because it, it was decades in development, um, is the Neuropace Responsive Neurostimulators uh, System, or some people call it RNS or Neuropace. So I just to include this um, here, I'm not going to read it to you, but the RNS system is um, for patients that don't have other therapeutic options. Um, it is a palliative device. Um, it's, it's not meant to make people seizure-free. In fact, the results of the, uh, on, in clinical trials are almost identical to the results I showed you for the vagal nerve stimulator. Um, but this can be used in patients that have more than one place the seizures are coming from and are not responding to medications. So what does it look like? So we now have a lot of patients at Penn with these devices. Um, so we have um, in contrast to last time I spoke here, which is a few years ago, um, we, we, we now have a lot of clinical experience with this. So um, the, the, um, there's a uh, stimulator is implanted flush with the skull, so um, it's actually put into the skull, and then we put these chronically implanted leads that are on the brain. And then when you go to your doctor's office, um, myself or one of the other epilepsy doctors, that, or your, your epilepsy doctor, would program the device. Um, so you hold up um, the stimulator to your, um, or the, the programmer right to your head, and then we can program it through the computer. And then at home, you can actually upload data from the, a home computer that you're given so that your physician can look at the seizure data on um, the cloud, so, or the internet. So this is kind of what it looks like on a film. And then the basic idea is the clinician sets up when to detect that a seizure is occurring and try to give a stimulus on that electrode in the brain to stop the seizure from continuing. So you can see that um, we, we can set up a detection in the red bar and then um, the hope is to give a stimulus then and then the seizure doesn't occur. These, just to do a brief overview of the clinical trials, there, there was a very large clinical trial done um, where they, have, um, they did a feasibility study, then they did uh, nearly 200 patients were implanted, and then looked at a long-term treatment study. And I won't go through the study trial design in the, in the interest of time, um, but, but they did collect baseline to see what the seizures were at baseline and then um, randomize people that had the implant to whether turn it on or not turn it on and then um, looked at whether it was working or not. They had a very wide range, all adults, of patients in this trial with a very high seizure frequency. You can see the um, mean number of seizures uh, in a month was, 30, was 34, so a lot, and one patient had 338 seizures in a month. Um, a, a large portion of them had prior vagal nerve stimulation, and also a large portion have had prior surgery. So um, this is a very complicated slide, um, but it's basically showing that compared to not turning it on versus turning it on, there was a, a significant difference in how many seizures there were. So um, what's important to realize that the likelihood of it of people responding didn't, was not shown to be uh, related to whether they've been previously treated with surgery or vagal nerve stimulator um, or other factors. And this is the slide I was talking about before. It looks almost identical to the vagal nerve stimulator slide in that as time went on, it looked like um, patients were responding better. And if you look out even farther than that, that um, bore true as well. So you can see the responder rate is very similar to the vagal nerve stimulator with about 50 to 55% of, of patients having at least a 50% reduction in their seizures. Um, what's interesting is they looked at a lot of other measures, and there was overall improvement on a lot of, of 
of uh, quality of life measures. Um, so that's always important as when we think as physicians about using this, this kind of treatment, making sure that we're not um, hurting other parts of a patient's life. Um, there were, of course, some side effects, but pretty low rates of side effects. Uh, most of them were fairly minor um, with some uh, just infection at the site, um, which could, and most of them could be easily dealt with. So um, um, overall, uh, people are fairly satisfied with the side effects. Important for us because mood is such an important part of epilepsy um, with about with about 50 percent of our drug resistant epilepsy population having um, significant um, mood issues as well. Um, they didn't see any prob adverse or worsening of mood in that initial study. So that was really the very important piece of this. And here is looking at even further out, which is, again, similar um, to the data I showed you before, where um, as time went on, it does seem like perhaps because um, the brain was restructuring its networks or that the, and the physicians are actually still changing the way the stimulation is happening, but it, it does seem that um, it does work better over time. So um, here's the longer-term seizure safety data. Again, it was, it was fairly safe. Um, uh, there was a, about 4% of patients that ended up getting explanted um, because of infection. Um, this is very comparable to the deep brain stimulator used in Parkinson's disease So, um, as, as a, a point of reference. So, and then they did see sustained improvements in quality of life um, and no problems with either cognition or your ability to think or mood. So in summary, the RNS system um, you know, has been proven and approved by the FDA as an effective and, and safe treatment for drug-resistant um, epilepsy patients. Um, this is for a very isolated group of patients who, um, in my mind, have really run through the other possibilities. But in those patients, we're fortunate to have another thing that we can offer, offer them. And like I said, we are starting. Um, we have we have now quite a few patients um, that are uh, that I, that overall have been quite satisfied with the NeuroPace device at our center. Um, you can still be a candidate if you've had prior surgery, prior vagal nerve stimulator implantation. Doesn't mean that you are not a candidate. And again, for us as physicians, we never want to give up, and um, this is something that gives us another option to, to treat our patients that, um, that were really struggling with the, current, the, the prior available options. So, um, so hopefully we, over time, will even be able to improve how well this device works as we um, improve the way that we stimulate, improve our knowledge of where's best to stimulate, um, and um, improve our knowledge of which patients are the best to pick for stimulation. So that was my last slide, and hopefully I didn't go over. I unfortunately don't have a watch, <laughs> um, but if if I hopefully left time for questions. Oh, I'm sorry. It, yes, I, there's a lot of terminology, unfortunately, when you have to, when talking about all of these new treatment options. So that just means the EEG in between seizures. Um, so when the patient was uh, uh, having a routine EEG. Um, so um, they just recorded a normal routine EEG in the, in the um, office. And with those patients with Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, for instance, the background of the EEG doesn't look um, like a uh, fully alert, um, high-functioning patient. So there's a lot of slowing in the background and other features. Um, so they look to see if those features improved or not. Unfortunately, it's not. So um, with the, when patients have seizures from both temporal lobes, that, that, that middle of the temporal lobe is critical for our um, memory. Um, so you can't take, you cannot remove both. So it's still removing the function when, when you're doing the um, laser. So it's very important that you um, are carefully evaluated for whether you'll still be able to function, um, have um, the memory that, that would allow you to do so. So um, for patients with, sometimes patients with a bi bilateral onset are very good candidates for um, the NeuroPace RNS system. I am going to have to cut Okay. Questions. Thank you, Dr. David.